So, okay. I'll be back on video in a little bit. Okay, I'm going to introduce Michael now. Um, so our speaker tonight, well, you probably know him, is Michael Bogdasarian. He's a he describes himself as a retired surgeon and amateur historian, but actually he has presented many, many military histories for us from the Civil War to before, in between the Civil War and World War I to World War I and now before World War II and the beginnings of World War II. His, his classes are comprehensive, they're precise, and they're understandable and they're wonderful. So here you go. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I do appreciate it. And I particularly appreciate the privilege of being able to give these lectures because this is something I love to do. I, I love history and I love the opportunity to share all of that with all of you. And it's, it's really an honor. Today, we're going to deal with the beginning of World War II. As most of you are aware, and some of you may have been children when the war was conducted, we have a great deal of familiarity with some of the events. But one of the key elements that's been a thesis of mine has been to understand the events, not just as occurring on a particular date or time, but to understand the implications or interpretations of these particular events and how they led to certain things happening down the road. In my last set of lectures on the interwar years and on the lectures that dealt with the second half of World War I, I began to emphasize the importance of ideology. And I'm gonna spend some time today recapping a little bit of what I spoke about in those lectures and then move into this particular arena. Now, as I've said before to many people, there are particular rules that I have in place. Uh, we will take a break after the end of the first hour. I will stick around uh, and answer questions either in between the lectures or afterward for as long as anyone wishes to. I'm setting out a series of goals that I wish to accomplish. Please let Lyceum and or me know any criticisms, suggestions, recommendations. Some of you may have already received a, a set of documents about the introduction to this particular course, because in that introduction, I've tried to lay out specifics in response to some of the comments that were made on my last set of lectures to try to explain why I'm doing some of the things I'm doing. And of course, email me anytime you wish. Uh, glad to hear from you and get into things in more detail. Particular goals that we're talking about. Role of ideology. In this particular conflict, particularly in the uh, China, the Sino-Japanese portion, but also in the Japanese-American portion, and especially, which I'm not going to discuss today, the war between Germany and Russia had a great deal of the ideology influencing how the war was fought. And that's a considerable difference from what most of us have believed to be the case when we think about the so-called Western Front, when the British, and then later the Americans fought the Germans. The second part is that there's an importance to understanding the military technology. The differences that exist or existed from World War I to World War II were profound. And there's too many historians or commentators who say that the French, for example, were fighting World War I over again, and the British were the ones who moved forward. I'll deal a bit with that as we go. I'm going to recap some of the events that I think were particularly important, but I'll do it in a very shortened fashion, because without understanding these particular events, 
will miss some of the implications of why the war ended up the way it is. And frankly, when I was putting this together, the events that have occurred in the Ukraine that we're currently dealing with are reflected in a sense in the things that have happened historically leading up to World War II. Now, I'm pretty certain in my own mind, we're not going to have World War III. I don't listen to the pundits on that, but there are similarities that are very important and help us interpret what's going on right now in Ukraine with what was going on back then. And that's where some of these issues come in. The other element that is distinctly different in World War II is the concept of total war. I'll deal a little bit with that. It has a different implication from what was initially interpreted by people at the time that World War I was a form of total war. It really wasn't, not to the degree at least that we'll see as we move into World War II. I mentioned these particular elements, let me, I don't know where that came from, uh, <clears throat> that are, we're going to touch on relatively briefly as we go through, but this will lead us up to the concept of when World War II breaks out. Now, I'm already going to put out something that's a little bit controversial, and I hope you'll forgive me when I actually misspeak about the beginning of World War II, because I'll state it right now. In one sense, World War II did not really begin until December 11th, 1941, when Germany declared war on the United States. After, this is four days after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Right. Pretty much all historians relate the beginning of World War II to the invasion of Poland on September 1st. And in a way, that's not true. That was the beginning of the second major European war, but it didn't become a world war until Germany brought the United States into the conflict with her declaration of war against the United States. I throw this out as well. Uh, sometimes I just put gratuitous quotations up there. But what this reflects is how ideology has a real influence on what's going to happen, not only in the lead up to the war, but in the conduct of the war itself. And the reason for this is really put into that first sentence that laws a lot more than words, because everything relates to the concept of justice, of right and wrong, our own particular conscience. Where ideology took over, it basically eliminated the issue of conscience and justice from human actions. And it took on a different connotation. And the connotation was that the ideology is everything. It's the truth. It is the only thing that really matters. And anything that deviates from that truth is subject to punishment. In some situations, the punishments were mild, but in others, severe, even to the point of annihilation. And this is something I want us to keep at least in the back of our minds as we go forward. Now, for a quick recap on the issues of ideology, these are all summary, simplistic interpretations, but they set the stage for what's coming. Communism, by Karl Marx's own determination, abolished private property. We have to keep that in mind because that separates communism from Nazism and from fascism. And I talked a bit about this the last time in the lectures on the interwar years where I went into it in more depth. One of the key people for the rise of fascism was this gentleman, Giovanni Gentile, or Gentile. I mentioned him in my last lecture. One of the key elements is what he's written down here provide the individual with his reason for being, 
his freedom and all his rights. So the idea here is that the state, and Mussolini also used this term, the state must be a totalitarian state. It must be a dictatorship in order to guide the people properly into what is really the best. The best state is the existence of the fatherland and everybody putting his efforts into supporting it. But this particular approach would also allow the individual to reach in a sort of pinnacle of his being. And therefore, it doesn't truly suppress creativity, individualism, as much as the word itself might imply. Now, it morphed during Mussolini's reign as El Duce for Italy, and it became oppressive. But this is true of what happens with most ideologies when they're firmly in control. That is that the right and privilege of the individual begins to diminish. Now, interestingly, this particular phrase or description by Adolf Hitler himself in 1938 is rather remarkable. And because it's a little fuzzy, I'll just read a short portion of it. True socialism values the individual and encourages him in individual efficiency. Holding his interests as an individual must be in consonance with those of the community. All great inventions, discoveries, and achievements were first the product of an individual brain. It's been charged against me, I am against property, that I am an atheist. Both charges are false. Now, this is an interesting description because unlike fascism, which was concentrated primarily around the control of the state, or unlike communism, in which everyone allegedly shared equitably in all property, which meant not just the land or housing, but in all aspects of the community, including culture and access to any goods or services. In this situation, the distortion that occurred with Nazism was the emphasis on race. And the definition of race was established by Hitler and by the authority that he was able to establish through laws. And we talked a little bit about that during the last uh, set of lectures. So here, what I want to do is emphasize how these different ideologies among the three nations of Italy, Germany, and Russia particularly influenced how they were going to fight the war and how they were going to incorporate their nations into the conduct of war and why this particular approach was more of an enactment of total war than existed in World War I. Now, I've left out Japan for a moment, but I haven't forgotten about them. I do bring this up because this goes back to that a quotation from the Oxbow incident that I put at the beginning. And I mentioned this during my last lectures. It's a very quick read. It's worth you looking at because it has great implications, again, for how the war is going to be fought when you start talking about race and the importance of race. But there's another aspect to this that is very important. And that is that once this law was passed, it meant the state could do anything it wanted to anyone, anyone at all, Aryan or non-Aryan, as it wished, because it allowed the government to strip away the rights of citizenship of a particular group. And therefore, once one group has been targeted, or in this case, Jews and non-Aryans, it meant anyone could be deprived of basic rights. It became legal. That's very different from moral, but when you have all the power controlled in your government, then it means the individual has no particular 
recourse other than either to submit or as we learn in 1942 to be truly annihilated <clears throat> now what about the other side i mean i've talked about those three countries and we all recognize the perversity of their particular ideologies what about the United States. Well, I again talked about this. I'm not going to read all this to you, but there's an essential message that Woodrow Wilson was addressing. And that is that there is to be a recognition of certain basic rights that will exist throughout the world. Wilson isn't talking about the United States alone. He's talking about the world. And during World War I, when these 14 points were brought forward as our particular approach to the war, in a sense, what we were looking at as the goals of entering the conflict on the side of France and Britain had very much to do with how the rest of the world interpreted this particular set of points. It became the ideological principle on which resistance in basically everywhere across the globe could look at this set of issues as outlined by Wilson and say, that's where we want to be. It had particular influence in the colonies held by France and Holland and Britain. As people began to see the opportunity to establish themselves as a country not ruled by a foreign power. The implications of this basically exist right up to today. Now, we feel in favor of much of this, but it occasioned enormous difficulty through the middle part of the 20th century in particular and in many ways led to the clear conflict between communism, as was being run primarily in Russia after the war was done, and the West, Britain, France, and the United States in particular. Now, in order to understand what leads up to war, we have to understand also that if you don't recognize war is coming, <laughs> then you're hardly going to be prepared for it. And unfortunately, in the history of the United States, that's been true more often than not. Indeed, all the way up through all of the major conflicts until about 1960, the United States was grossly unprepared to enter into violent conflict. And it was only through the kind of shifting that began to occur after Vietnam, and we led up to the issues related to the first Gulf War, that we demonstrated any willingness, if you will, because that is a key emphasis, but ability to prepare for conflict, to have ourselves ready for conflict. And these particular elements that, I'm that I've listed here have a great impact, if you wish, to translate this to what Russia's done in their catastrophe in fighting in Ukraine. How well prepared were they? How did they put their technology together? Much of this has a great influence, of course, on the onset of World War II, and in particular, probably more than any other nation in history, Germany had prepared by looking at all these elements and establishing answers or policies that would address them. Now, I mentioned these slides, they're a little bit um, busy. I only mention this in order to show that over a period of time, over a period of decades, in this case, leading up to 1913, how different governments began to respond to the issues of, I'm sorry, that was a bad click. Um, respond to the threats of coming war. And you'll see that as the 
Russo-Japanese conflict occurs through here, that there's a sudden escalation in universal spending, that the UK, seeing that Germany is now working on developing a navy and getting ready for it, the spending throughout the world begins to escalate. But this is an aberration because most of this is driven by Britain. Here's another example of just looking at the national defense outlays. And this is related to the United States. Now, I'm sorry that that doesn't show up well, but it shows that we had a spike, of course, with World War I. And then notice not only how low it fell as a percent of GDP, but notice that it is down around the one or 2% range and only grew gradually until almost 1940. Now, war broke out in 1939 and the European continent. The United States clearly had been struggling with the depression, but if you look at, and we will look at the spending in other countries, you realize that they were way ahead of us. And it wasn't until we were almost in the war that our spending spiked. And then as you'll see, <laughs> The typical behavior of the United States is to say the heck with this. But you'll notice here, as we got into the region of the first Gulf War, kind of peaking up to that as we bring the Cold War to an end. And then since then, our, GD, our uh, gross domestic product percentage, I'm sorry, of uh, defense spending has run at this 4 to 5% level. No other country except China is matching that. Now, by 1940, again, by comparison, you'll see that the percent of GDP devoted towards the um, military spending is really substantial. But notice this, 35 to 40% in Germany. Now, comparison, Italy's only at 5.9%, Russia 10.8%. But Britain was beginning to reach a higher level as they recognized the particular threat. <coughs> Excuse me. And France is at 34, almost 35% here. Here is this so flat. But they begin to recognize the dangers that they're facing. There are a lot of reasons for that. But as you look across the place where the war is going to break out, the numbers here are very clear as to who was anticipating being involved and who wasn't. <clears throat> now, this is just a different kind of illustration of that. But what it shows, and I think is important, is that France had lowered its defense spending down below the 3% line. But as it got into the 30s, notice how it escalated. Up, and this only goes to 1938. You'll see this same kind of line for the United Kingdom. As they began to confront the realities of German rearmament, they began to say, we've got to prepare for war. Now, it's an important element to understand certain philosophic issues that are present at the time. The 30s, there's worldwide depression. Yet, military expenditures for France and Britain escalate. France first, because France sees itself as the weaker power facing a resurgent Germany. So that has a great deal of implications for them. And they got the wind in their sails much sooner. Similarly, Britain held off, <coughs> but as things changed, notice here's 1933, all right? Notice that France's spending increased before Hitler. Hitler comes in at 33. Notice that once 33 oh, yeah. hits, now England begins to react. At least with, with uh, any that I know of, like militia founders or things like that. So the uh... The questions are really more pertaining to the documents that you had turned over. So at least. Good. <laughs> I kind of lost part of that. 
Did anyone that know? Was, no, that was someone who accidentally had a conversation going. Uh, I think she's in a hospital room. It must have been a nurse that came in to talk. Oh, so I just okay. muted it. That's all. All right. Well, I hope that the person in the hospital has a monitor on and that uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not uh, doing too much to, uh, to, to make them have feel bad about all that. Um, the other part here that you notice is, of course, the spending in Germany, and you'll see that it's down in the dumps here, and this is partly because of the Versailles Treaty and the restrictions that were put in place on her. But then you'll just see this sudden huge resurgence that occurs within just a year and a half, two years after Hitler comes to power. <clears throat> and notice that that is up at an un almost unsustainable number. No country can put that much into military growth unless you have a particular intent to use it. So in itself, that becomes a warning sign. I showed this as well. Again, I'm not going to test anyone as to what this all means. All right. So at the end of the course, there's no exam. But the idea behind it is just to show that in World War II, the resources that were mobilized become enormous. And you'll see numbers like this, UK up at 69% share of government spending, USA at 71, and so on and so forth. These kinds of things demonstrate that modern industrial nations can bring together enormous resources. Now, the Ukraine is not particularly modern in one sense, their particular economy was among the poorest of European nations. But even so, what they were able to do in terms of just mustering people to help defend their country is something that just wasn't anticipated. Similarly, as nations moved up from World War I into World War II, there still was a lack of understanding of what modern industrial nations could bring to the fight that were extraordinary. In my mind, which we're not gonna talk about at all in this lecture series, is what Russia was able to do and Germany able to do in World War II. <clears throat> now, this is just a, I'm sorry, a simpler reflection that is better than that slide, which I'll get rid of. <laughs> I show this as well because resources were absolutely one of the driving factors that controlled the strategies of the nations involved in the conflict. And I simply bring this out because what you'll notice over here is the USA number one in oil production. Keep that in mind for a moment and think about our current situation. This is not a political discussion. I'm not criticizing anyone for any decisions that are made. I'm just trying to point out that the United States back in 1940 was the major producer of oil. Notice that number two, which we're hearing about constantly in the current conflict was Russia. We talk about the Middle East, and you'll see that Iran is four, Iraq is eight, but look down here at Venezuela, number three. Think about where Venezuela is today, just as an example. And this has to do with various pipelines. Now, if you were to get a modern map and you see the pipelines from the USSR into what we'll call Western Europe for sake of discussion, it's there are just a whole myriad of them. Oil was key. Over here, you'll notice that Japan and even China don't even have a number applied to them in the top 10. You'll see that the Netherlands and India is number five. Yet Japan, being an island nation, by obligation has to be a naval nation as well. In order to run a Navy, you need an enormous amount of oil at this time frame. 
And this drives much of the strategy. Now, in terms of the technology, and I've tried to abbreviate this, but I'm gonna run through these slides because I think they have great relevance in understanding some of the developments that were occurring and how they impacted the coming conflict. First, is just look at the listing that I have. Don't worry about the numbers in the top, although that's interesting in and of itself, but all of the different elements that have to be considered, and I've left some out, that have to be adjusted if you're going to conduct modern war. Now, again, to just use as a parallel, we've seen in the current conflict in Ukraine how particularly logistics have played an enormous role. I think all of us who've been paying any attention to the news heard about this 40 mile long line of vehicles that were apparently stuck on a road into Ukraine. <coughs> An interesting element is that it was thought they ran out of fuel, but they were also running out of food had to get all that. They clearly had enough clothing and ammunition and things of that nature. But once you start intense combat, particularly combat in cities like Mariupol and others, you burn up an enormous amount of ammunition very quickly. And your caloric expenditure of every soldier goes up enormously as well. So if you can't feed them, if you can't get water to them, they're going to become exhausted very quickly. The key changes that occurred, however, were really here. Tanks and armored vehicles, which had played a role, and I said during my lectures on World War I that I thought the importance of tanks in particular was a bit overblown but there were great lessons to be learned. The development of tanks and in specific nature, how those tanks were constructed, what they were meant to do became a critical issue in how the war was fought. And unless that's understood, we simply are just reading about events, but without any understanding. And we'll talk about that more when we actually come to those conflicts. The other part here has to do with education and exercises. In this situation, under the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was not permitted to have any tanks. Their artillery pieces were limited to a relatively small number and of relatively small size just as a, a way of thinking about it. Yet, when we look at the German army and its performance in 1939, 1940, 1941, what they could accomplish was extraordinary. And we'll talk a little bit about how that comes to be when we come to some specifics. But notice all these other things that have to be included, medical care and evacuation and things of this sort. You can have all the modern weapons you want, but if your soldiers aren't trained to use them properly, and if they're not integrated into a proper tactical plan where there's proper communication to a doctrine so that everybody knows what the role is and how they're all to come together to perform, then it's nothing more than a lot of hardware and it often can end up just sitting on a road. Now, the influence of technology is what drives how the war is fought, but how you wish to fight the war determines how you put together your technology. And this particular duality, this balance requires a great deal of analysis and oversight by senior officers. And they have to be well enough educated to have looked back into history and 
formulate ideas about the kind of conflict they anticipate they're going to have to engage in in the future. A good example for us as the United States was that the kind of conflict we anticipated and trained for up to Vietnam was a conventional conflict in Europe. When we get into Vietnam, suddenly a lot of that has to change. We have to develop a whole new set of doctrines into how we're going to integrate the various arms, and we have to redevelop or develop new technologies in order to achieve those goals. In this period of time leading up to World War II, the basic breakdown for understanding the use of tanks was in these three categories. The infantry tank, which was slow, relatively heavily armored, and was to be there to help infantry overcome obstacles and resistance and things of that nature. Reconnaissance tanks had to be fast, scoot around, see what's going on, maybe engage infantry, but stay away from the big guys and get back with your information to headquarters. In the battle tank, which is really a misnomer of sorts, this is tank on tank warfare. So if you know the enemy has a tank heavy unit somewhere, what do you engage? You use your own tanks. And this was a bit of a change, a real distinct change from anything that had been experienced in World War I. So what does this look like? Again, don't worry about the details. I'm just gonna point out something here. It's slow and it has very limited range. The German officer corps looked at this and said, yeah, this may have been what was okay in World War I when basically you had trenches and you couldn't go very far because you didn't have to, but modern warfare isn't gonna be like that at all. So what do you do? Well, the French also were thinking heavily about this. Notice the road speed. 23, range 160 miles, thinking, well, you're, you're not going to drive 160 miles, are you? Well, the point is you have to be able to maneuver. Maneuver means greater distances. You have to move faster so that you're not such an easy target. And a weapon like this is going to be used against other tanks. That's what the 47 millimeter gun is going to do. And you have to be able to sort of fend off infantry with this machine gun. I showed this because, again, the details don't matter specifically. But what I want you to understand is the following. You look at these kinds of French tank guns, all right? We've just talked about the 47 millimeter. Look at the range, 1,500 meters. That's roughly a mile, right? Notice the muzzle velocity is gonna run around 2,400 feet per second. So it doesn't take long, two seconds for a shot. If you can see something that far away, about two seconds for it to reach it. And depending upon the armor, you can penetrate as much as 33 millimeters at 500 meters, which is really considerable. And notice when you get up to the 75 millimeter, you can penetrate that much. All of these things play an enormous influence on how you're going to structure the doctrines and training for your soldiers to employ these weapons sufficiently. Anti-tank weapons were beginning to get developed in World War I, but basically everybody knew these were going to be insufficient. Therefore, the emphasis on anti-tank weapons shifted considerably. And the reason I show this is this thing. If you look at this, you'd say, it doesn't look like it can do squat, okay? I mean, it's this dinky little weapon. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but notice that its effective range was out to 1,000 meters. And at 500 meters, it could penetrate 29 millimeters of armor. This is something you can manhandle with a couple of guys and you can hide it. And that becomes an important element in defense because that's what this weapon is for. This isn't an attack weapon, this is a defense weapon. 
Notice that in Germany, this particular infamous weapon, the 88, milli 88 millimeter flat gun, which was actually designed to shoot at aircraft, later became one of the most notorious anti-tank weapons and notice its particular range and notice armor penetration at 500 meters. That's extraordinary. Practically nothing could stand against that. Now, <clears throat> the key element that I'm trying to work towards in this particular discussion, though, is how did Germany go from having basically nothing at the end of World War I to having a dominant military just 20 years later? The Treaty of Versailles as I've outlined here, shows 100,000 soldiers, about 4,000 officers. They were supposed to get rid of the general staff, not have any real schools that would train officers at high levels, and their weaponry was severely limited. How did Germany get around this? Well, starting under this man's control, General von Sieck, he set up a surrogate and he began to look at the 100,000 and said, who's going to be part of the 100,000? We just demobilized at the end of World War I several million soldiers. How do I establish 100,000? I have my pick of veterans, and I can designate that someone as low as a corporal not an officer, was actually a captain from World War I. So I have somebody who has combat experience, has a high level already of understanding doctrine and training and things of that sort, because that's much of what they did, as well as understand combat itself. So once I develop this particular cadre, and I have not 100,000 soldiers, but I have 100,000 potential officers, then I've got something very special. But similarly, what about the evolving technology? Well, pretty much the German military had its weapons taken away. The Navy had practically nothing. The Air Force was considered to be non-existent under the Treaty of Versailles. So you're not allowed to have armor. You're not allowed to have large artillery pieces. What do you do? Well, interestingly, he was able to work out cooperation with Soviet Russia. Now, you think to yourself, why would the Soviets agree to cooperate with the Germans when the Germans attacked Russia, beat it back, punished it severely, and then use the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk to undermine its territorial gains and actually take a great deal, including a good portion of Ukraine, under its authority. Because at the time, the Soviets had suffered enormously, barely winning their civil war. So now they needed to reconstruct their military forces and they knew that the Germans were creative and inventive. The Soviet system was uh, bereft, we'll say, of any substantial industrial capacity that had to be built up uh, very carefully, but they didn't have the technological expertise that the Germans could provide. So how did this work out? He said, well, we'll give you areas where you can develop aircraft and armor. And if you show us the blueprints, we can help manufacture for these in our factories. But then we need your expertise to create those factories. And we'll also get a little eyeball on how you train and what your doctrine is. And then we will see about incorporating that into our system. It had to be done very secretively, and it was. There were different times during the 20s, particularly the latter part of the 20s, where great actions were taken by the government to suppress any indication that this cooperation existed. Now, 
I showed this as well because I want to illustrate the complexity that goes on once you begin to look at modern warfare. And this particular complexity all had to be not just put down on paper, it's always nice to draw it out, but all of these different elements that you see that are incorporated into an army, a core, divisions, and so on, and then you break down the divisions and you break down brigades and regiments and the rest, all of this has to be integrated. If it's not integrated, it's nothing more than a pretty chart. And the determinations of what's to be incorporated also have to be considered very, very carefully. And that's what this little listing over here on the right is, is how many tanks were present in a French armor division in 1940 and all the rest of the stuff that goes along with it. For most of us, this is dry, almost uninteresting stuff. But if you look at the fighting that's going on in Ukraine right now, and you pay a little bit of attention to what's being used to conduct this fighting by both sides, it begins to bring home the importance of proper training, proper support, proper integration. The other thing I just want to show is this. Comparison of forces in 1940, the Germans remember by the Treaty of Versailles until that was rejected by Hitler shortly after he became chancellor and then president and chancellor and therefore Fuhrer had built up to 3,500 aircraft. That's an extraordinary number. Look at what's down here. What is Germany going to do with 3,500 aircraft? You're not going to have them just sit on airfields. Okay, oops, sorry. Now, we hear much about this because the French, as I showed in an earlier slide, were beginning to spend a great deal of money on their military and on their defenses. We hear about the Maginot Line and many people disparage it because as is true of most obstacles, you either somehow force your enemy to attack it head on or the enemy finds a way around it. And indeed, as we know from the opening phases of World War II, when Germany attacks Belgium, the Netherlands, and France in May of 1940, that they went around the Maginot Line. The Maginot Line served its purpose. Its primary purpose, expensive and as complex as it was, with the training associated with it was designed to keep the Germans from attacking directly on the border between Germany and France. But if they did, they were going to be punished severely. This sets up an interesting issue that is sometimes overlooked in understanding how France collapsed once war broke out and Germany invaded. But from the standpoint of what it took to put this together, and they were in the process of considering moving the line further up to the channel, this line served its purpose. It kept the Germans from attacking it directly. <clears throat> now, what about the Navy? This had a much greater impact on Britain and also on the United States, but it also had an enormous impact on Japan and a somewhat lesser impact initially on Germany. But the idea here was that up until the late 30s, battleships were still considered the queen of the line. And you'll see this when we come to the war plans that were developed particularly by the United States in trying to deal with Japan's threat as it was seen. Notice too that submarines, which we all recall became a dominant German force in World War II, were prohibited by the Treaty of Versailles. And yet, in a relatively short period of time, 
German industry and technology created a threat that almost brought Britain to her knees. But related to that as well as look at this issue. For the United States, we have two big oceans on either side. We are, despite our continental presence in North America, a maritime nation. And that means that our composition of the fleet, its training, its structure, and how to support it over distance became very, very important. During this period of time as well, two critical developments in technology of radar and sonar, but I'm also leaving out all of the other communications related to wireless and the rest of it. But these two things had an enormous influence on how the war was conducted. But doctrine played an, an enormous role as well. And as you can see in this slide, it becomes a critical element, particularly in dealing with submarine warfare and amphibious attacks and the ascendancy of the aircraft carrier. Now, I show these things quickly again, and I, my apologies to those who resist looking at technology like this or in this depth. But the point that I'm trying to make, again, is that technology did not stand still at all. It was constrained, particularly in the naval sphere, by the London treaties, which limited the number of ships that or tonnage, sorry, maritime tonnage, that would be permitted to Britain, the United States, Japan, and so on. But for the United States and for Britain, a lot of the ships that were made had been made prior to or surrounding the time of World War I. So the USS Arizona, which we all have heard about, sunk at Pearl Harbor with a major loss of life and still serves as a memorial there, was built in 1916. But even then, the power of these battleships was considerable. And you'll notice that it was relatively fast, had a very good range, and its 14-inch guns could range 21,000 yards. Now think about that just in terms of your, as they used to call it, the Mark IV eyeball. You're looking out 21,000 yards, even a big ship is going to look pretty darn small. So you have to have considerable support on board the ship in order to be able to target what you're going to do uh, to even see your enemy. Later on, the Prince of Wales, much larger, a little bit faster. Its range here looks shorter by far, but that's 31 miles per hour. That's moving pretty fast. Cruising range was much, much greater. Here, 14-inch guns could fire a little bit further, not a lot further. I showed this because the broadside weight of the shells by these guns, if they were to strike simultaneously, is this, seven and a half tons of screaming metal coming down on top of you. They also began to recognize the danger of aircraft. Otherwise, why would you have this? But look at the Yamato. This is probably the biggest ship built during World War II, even bigger than the Bismarck. But notice here, 31 miles per hour, but the thing that matters 18.1 inch guns with a range of 45,000 yards. Now, engagement ranges were often much shorter, but what this demonstrates is the enormous power that exists within this kind of weapon. And it had to be taken very, very seriously because if you were confronting something like this, this weapon was capable of destroying your ships before you even got within range. And that in itself would be a considerable danger. I also point out to look at the armor, uh, the turret. You're talking two feet of metal to protect 
the turrets. This is just a visual of the shells, nearly 3,000 pounds. And this is propelled by powder <coughs> put into uh, fabric containers and shoved in behind the shell once the shell is loaded in the gun. Would not like that coming towards me. Aircraft carriers were beginning to be considered important at the end of World War I, but they hadn't reached any degree of sophistication. This is one of the first that was designed as an aircraft carrier. Notice, <coughs> excuse me, 20 aircraft, okay? Not a lot. And their primary purpose was to serve for observation, to find other enemy ships. They were less in the attack mode. <clears throat> but the Japanese very quickly began to look at the aircraft carrier as an offensive weapon. And as they moved into that particular arena, as you'll see, the Akagi was initially not a carrier, but it was reclassified. That had to do with the London Accords. And notice the number of aircraft. 66. And as modernization took place, they didn't really have the 25 in reserve anymore. Japanese carriers never got to that capacity. But the point was that you could put on here now these kinds of weapons, which were defensive or escorts, that is, they defend the carrier against oncoming attacks, or you would have torpedo and dive bombers. <clears throat> So you could carry the fight to someone else. And of course, the range and capacity would be well beyond even the Yamato of 45,000 yards. Now you can travel 100 miles or more. And the Japanese aircraft actually had greater range than American aircraft for a considerable part of the war. The United States also began to understand the importance of changing its technology and shifting not from the importance of the battle line, as you'll see when we come to war plans for the United States. It wasn't until late that the carrier became an independently organized, structured, offensive weapon. But what mattered was that the capacity of our carriers was greater than that of the Japanese. So when you see things like the Battle of Midway or uh, Leyte Gulf and things of this sort, and you say how many ships you had, this and that. What you forget is that American carriers had more aircraft than Japanese carriers, and therefore it took fewer carriers to get as much air power up in the air doing what you wanted to do. Of course, that also meant you were fewer targets, and that in itself could be a problem. But they began to armor the American uh, carriers again, and these were not designed to engage other ships. So that, you want to run away when that happens. Uh, you'll notice the top speed gave you that possibility. 38 miles an hour for a ship that was developed and operated through the 20s and 30s. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary when you think about it. What about submarines? I already mentioned that under the German naval agreement, all right, this, the size of the German Navy was to be substantially reduced. They weren't allowed to have any submarines. The submarines that were developed in the 20s and 30s basically were still largely coastal. They weren't really designed to operate out in the open sea, the open ocean. So how is it that the Germans were able to develop submarines, which within a short period of time after the onset of the war in 39, the European war, could begin to surge large numbers of submarines out into the Atlantic and eventually, especially in 42, even reach and operate <coughs> at the American coast. And all of this has to do with communication, <coughs> 
It has to do with how good your torpedoes are and things of that nature, which the Japanese outdid everybody in that regard. By 1939, notice this, 1939, six years after Hitler takes over, the German submarine could range 15,480 miles surfaced, okay? <clears throat> and it didn't operate as well submerged, it was, it was slower, but it could dive to 750 feet. And the armaments were considerable and it could be used for mine operations as well. Mining operations became an important part, especially in the channel, because you could disrupt merchant ships by seeding mines along the uh, channel area and in front of the channel ports. What else changed? America had to have the amphibious possibilities in order to deal with Japan. And this just emphasizes, I'll, and I'll finish up this section on technology and then we'll take a break, uh, to begin to show the complexity of landing troops on a foreign shore. <clears throat> Look at the Ukraine-Russian conflict, and you may have heard that there were three Russian ships that landed at a port in Southern Ukraine. And one of them was blown up, apparently with a missile. And another was severely damaged. And the other, I think, escaped without any significant damage. That kind of injury, if you will, severely restricts your ability to bring in not just the troops in the initial landing, but it also alters your logistical support. Very quickly, those people run out of fuel and ammunition and food if they're not getting continued support. The United States was looking at the Pacific and saying, if we have to engage Japan, the probability of us having ports to use is very small. So we have to develop a very complex organization that can allow us to land on contested beaches. And this played a huge role as well in the Normandy landings, uh, if we ever get to that point in lectures, as to how complicated that was and the issues that had to be taken care of. Now, I'll just finish up quickly here with a couple of slides and then we'll take our break. The Air Force technology had already been developing in World War I and became a very important element in the conduct of the war in World War I. But therefore, the driving element of the technology was to enhance and expand the capacity of the Air Force and integrate it well with the rest of the military forces. And this took place differently in each of the different countries. And that becomes a very important element in how the initial parts of the war in particular were conducted. And here I'm just gonna point out something very quickly. Heavy bombers basically were ignored by Germany. She had very few, very limited capacity. The blitz was not conducted by heavy bombers. However, the United States and Britain did look at heavy bombers, and that means you're carrying the war into another nation's political boundaries, which is different from using them to help your ground forces or to assist your Navy. This is all technologically based. As we see here, it's up with Camel, one of the most famous fighters of World War I, okay? 115 miles an arc could go all the way up to 19,000 feet. And if you didn't have oxygen, you were going to pass out. 130 mile range. Whoa, this, the Spitfire, which we've all heard of, which in many ways was actually a second class fighter in World War II. All right. But at this point, 346 miles an hour. We're talking just 20 years. And the escalation and ability is extraordinary. 30,000 feet. <clears throat> 
the armament, eight machine guns. Here's a bomber from the war, 1917. Actually, not too bad. 1,100 pounds of bombs, range 520 miles, 87 miles an hour. <laughs> this is what the Germans used primarily through the war as a bomber, not as a heavy bomber, range of 1,000 miles, all right, could carry 4,000 pounds, depending on type. What about torpedo planes? Well, these weren't even used in World War I because that wasn't a function. Any aircraft used in World War I in terms of naval support were observation. But now, slow in 1929, but the Kate, speed 230, look at the range of the Kate, pretty amazing. Or it could carry bombs, depending. Dive bombers, again, just began to think about them in World War I, but most of the time, any tactical use of aircraft was through machine guns and dropping small bombs, and they weren't really all that great. 1936, 220 miles an hour, 400 pounds of bombs, and that changed pretty dramatically. The Germans, one of their most famous dive bombers, the Stuka, Ju-87, 1,000 pounds of bombs, could go up to 26,000 feet, pretty fast, pretty good range. So all of this had to be integrated. All of this had to be organized. If it wasn't, and it was intense training to bring these things to fruition according to how you felt you wanted to conduct the coming conflict. All of that had to come together. And the different approaches in doctrine to combined arms had an enormous effect on the opening session, opening parts of the war, which we'll come to in later issues. And I'm just going to mention two other quick technological developments. Proximity fuse, which didn't come in until 43. You fire this up in the air, it gets near a target, and it blows up. Pretty amazing when you think about it. You didn't actually have to hit the thing to bring it down. But this was one of the most important elements, particularly emphasized by the Germans, and that was the radio communication. The Germans quickly appreciated you wanted a radio in just about every vehicle of any type. That meant airplanes, tanks, personnel carriers, and so on, ships, submarines, the whole bit. <clears throat> All right, we'll take a break. Uh, let's take a five minute break, bathroom break as anyone needs and I'll stay here and I will answer any questions anybody may wish to pose. Yeah, and, and those who are sleeping, just make sure you leave your mute button on. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> Hi, Michael. Um, you've been talking about the Ukraine and tanks, and I've seen the pictures of a rocket launcher, anti-tank missile that one man can sling on his back yeah. and turn a, a World War II vintage Russian tank into a toaster oven. Now, um, Tom, just, uh, I may have missed the last part. Is it more a statement or a question? Um, well, I was just going to comment, you know, compare, you showed that little French artillery piece. Yes. And now they have the one man backpack mm -hmm. anti-tank missile, which I said turns a World War II vintage state-of-the-art tank into a toaster oven. Right. Yes, exactly. And, and one so of the I... key things that you've just emphasized is that the propaganda, if you will, <clears throat> that surrounded 
Yeah, <clears throat> sorry about that. Uh, that surrounded the development of the brand new Russian tank and the technological considerations that went into it. We haven't seen it on the battlefield. Uh -huh. And part of the reason for that, I think, is the Russians weren't willing to commit it to combat because at this particular point, they weren't sure enough that it would perform the way they liked. And the idea of losing one of those modern battle tanks to somebody with a shoulder fired javelin just wasn't going to be acceptable. Uh -huh. Now, the other tanks that we haven't seen, that we've seen in Ukraine so far, interestingly, demonstrated their inadequacies in the Gulf conflicts and how the Abrams tank, by example, showed greater resistance to RPGs and things of that sort. I think there's a story where one tank finally was disabled after literally taking about 40 hits from an RPG. I mean, you just got to get lucky at some point. But <clears throat> the capacity of tanks to engage other tanks is something that was still considered and still is considered one of the key issues. Why didn't it happen in Ukraine? According to a report that I saw just a little while ago, the Russians took out a lot of the Ukrainian army early on. But as you just pointed out, especially when you get into close quarter combat, especially in cities, then a guy with a javelin on his shoulder is more dangerous than a neighbor's tank at 2,000 meters. Uh, he's just, he's just going to do you in. And there's some interesting things that in response to that, to just show how things change, there are some photographs of Russian tanks that have built a cage over the top of the tank. They have reactive armor around the turret and around the body of the tank, but the javelin hits you from above. So they've makeshifted <clears throat> these cages to try to go above the tank and see if they can detonate the javelin before it actually hits the tank. It's, it's just amazing to, to see these kinds of changes occur. I think it's coming up first. Okay. Okay. No other questions, comments? I have a question. Sure. Um, going back to, uh, wait a minute. That's wrong. Yeah. Going back to the beginning of your lecture on uh, ideology as put forth by. Marx and then Hitler and Mussolini. I just wondered which came first, the belief in the ideology, or is it really these warped, I'll call them leaders, who formulate an ideo ideology so that they can justify their uh, desire for power and their uh, subordinating their population to their own narcissistic sociopathy that we're still mm -hmm. seeing today. I, I, I really, uh, I'm going to just state my own belief before I let you answer. And that is uh, all of these ideologies put forth, including Putin, are phenomenally sick. Maybe that's because we've been informed by democracy. But I look at all of these leaders who have the chance to be benevolent when you get to be a leader. Instead, they become astoundingly malevolent 
and you have to ask what's the deep human psychological defect and i look at it as somehow pathologic people get into leadership positions so let me ask your response to that well it's i have, I have a sort of quick uh answer to it and it's um, it's the old idea of which comes first, the chicken or the egg. And I'm reminded of a cartoon that shows a chicken in bed with an egg and the egg is smoking a cigarette. And the chicken says, I guess we know which came first. Uh, not to make light of your comment, but I think the issue there is that we'll take communism just as an example uh, that the history of communism was derived in good measure as a philosophic approach to understanding the abuses of industrialization and particularly the abuses levied against factory workers. If you read through that particular formulation in history from the late 1800s up to the time of Lenin, Many of the things that Marx and Engels wrote about, we could actually find ourselves agreeing with. There were principles that kind of made unbridled capitalism, what's called the robber baron era, uh, just put the individual down as totally worthless. And part of the idea of Marxism in its fundamental form was to resurrect, if you will, the individual, but do it within the context of a particular equity, if you will. Everybody shares equally. And in that, there was a denial of human nature. So of necessity, in part, in order to correct all these abuses, and I'm really simplifying this, Lenin, when he became the leader in Russia, said, the ideology represents our utopia. This is what we are to work towards. And therefore, <coughs> everything becomes subordinate to that. That actually perverted, in a particular way, the very issue you just mentioned. That is that the individual no longer really counted for much except as the individual contributed to the progress of the ideology, to the utopia that was set up by the ideology. And then under someone like Stalin, it was further corrupted, although Lenin was responsible for a lot of that corruption to begin with, but it was further corrupted by Stalin who for a variety of reasons, not just a single one of wanting power, but for a variety of reasons, was willing to use unbridled force. And ultimately it goes in a sense to that comment about power corrupts absolutely and absolute power corrupts absolutely, that he was in a position of authority where in time, he became for himself, this is my interpretation, he became for himself the arbiter of all that was to be good, but it was not good. It was perverse and destructive. Mussolini's approach was a little less destructive in terms of what he was looking at with fascism. And he wanted to order society without necessarily eliminating the importance of the individual. Hitler from the get-go looked to have the reins of power in order to get rid of the people he considered to be most threatening to the ascension of Germany, not just in Central Europe, but to the dominance in the global sphere. It didn't mean that he wanted to conquer the United States or anything like that, but his particular philosophy was there are important races in the world 
And some of these races must be eliminated for Germany to achieve what she wants. And again, that meant that anything he thought needed to be done could be done. Interestingly, he actually had little personal wealth. So it wasn't a matter of what we see in the kleptocracy in Russia right now with leaders gathering enormous amounts of money to themselves. Uh, Putin was allegedly worth $40 billion. Nobody would have ever said that Hitler was a millionaire. What, where he lived, where, however elaborate the facilities were state owned. He didn't see them as personal property. People under him were more than willing to acquire personal wealth, Goebbels in particular, and to do Hitler's bidding because as the power structure was organized, it was better for them to ally themselves closely with Hitler, even if they believed in the ideology, but they also had these secondary benefits that allowed Goebbels in particular to acquire personal wealth and someone like Himmler who on the surface doesn't look like he's much of anything. Uh, to have great reign and power. And that kind of corruption led to enormous problems. Japan was a little different. And the construct for the United States, Britain, France, if you're willing to put aside how France in particular treated indigenous people in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, basically said they were worthless, or if we look back on the history of slavery in Britain and the United States and so on, you know, there's, there's plenty of trouble to go around. But I think our ideology overall, the one we've embraced in this country, has led to much better good throughout the world than communism, fascism, or Nazism were ever capable of achieving. I, I hope that answers the question. Okay, I'm um, sorry to, you know, once I get started, you know, Ron, I get wound up, I just keep going. <laughs> All right, we'll hit the second part. And I'm going to just do something quick here. All right. I, I like this phrase from Paul Simon, <clears throat> because it really epitomizes what is coming. And the awareness that leaders at the time had or ignored that led to this conflict. And I'm not saying that World War II could have been avoided. That's a different topic and I won't go there for this. But I just want to realize there were things that hinted at what was coming and the world needed to pay attention to them. One of these was the anti common turn pact, which on the surface, probably didn't trouble anybody very much because this was directed against Russia. And while there was still great concern because Germany <clears throat> was insurgent during this period, uh, there was a great deal of concern over communism, which continued to offer that it was to be global in nature. And communist organizations were set up all over the world. Uh, with different effectiveness in different places. But what really began to turn, and it's a very interesting element to consider, is that once Hitler took over, he very quickly got rid of the conditions of the Versailles Treaty. He just basically said, we're done with this. And he began to make moves, which on the surface made sense not just to the German people, but to France and Britain and Russia and the United States. And that is to reincorporate according to, in a sense, Wilson's own 14 points that large German populations that had been cut off from their political boundary with Germany needed to be reincorporated. And these are just some of the elements that occurred. What we begin to see is that this emphasis on ethnicity, largely promoted through the 14 points, begins to escalate in its importance 
as different nations begin to look at the surrounding regions and say, we've got populations here and there, and they really belong to us, but there's this artificial political boundary that is separating us, and that cannot continue. So I put these in mind. Also, something that we're not really familiar with was that the Italian <coughs> chamber pushed France to cede Corsica and Tunisia to it. Uh, you say, well, what's North Africa got to do with this? This has to do with some historical relationships that I won't go into here. <clears throat> Even as late as 1938, all right, notice that within a year, all right, Germany's going to attack Poland and there's going to be the development of the Europe, first year, Europe, second European war. Agreement to guarantee borders. So as we look at all these international agreements, we must keep in mind that the only way in which you can guarantee a border is if you're willing to defend it. If you're not willing to defend it, it doesn't matter. Now, <clears throat> as we move through these particular dates, and we'll cover them differently as we go through, but I just want you to understand the direction that we're going with these lectures you'll see that there were a great many of events which occurred through 1939 until we lead up to Germany actually invading Poland and shortly thereafter, Russia invading. I show this slide, busy as it is, not with the intent that anybody's going to read it, but to show that in 1936 to 39, there were enormous difficulties within Europe itself. In a very strange way, it is Europe that led to World War I and World War II, <laughs> interestingly. Supposedly, the uh, more educated and economically successful nations in the world are the ones that end up going to war. Indeed, prior to World War I, it had been said because of the economic interrelationships of all of those different countries, war was not possible. Mm -hmm. And yet it broke out. And here again, we see a very similar kind of issue. In other words, just look at the red ink and you'll see how many places were involved in different crises. And this leaves out some of the other parts of the world. <clears throat> Now, as I mentioned uh, in my last set of lectures, Italy decided for reasons of her own particular ego, and that driven particularly by Mussolini, who wanted Italy to become sort of a modern Roman empire of sorts, decided that he would invade Ethiopia. And there's a lot of shenanigans that went on around that time. The conflict took on uh, an enormous importance in international affairs. But basically, because it was in Africa, it didn't really rise to anyone's deep concerns. And despite Emperor Haile Selassie's plea in front of the League of Nations, which has been quite famous and so on, Europe turned its back and allowed Ethiopia to basically. <clears throat> As it turns out for Italy, this was a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, what they accomplished actually did nothing except serve as a greater drain on their resources. And while Mussolini could tout that the Italian empire is coming back, in terms of practicality, it had little to do. What about the Spanish Civil War? We talked about that during the last set of lectures. This again was a great crisis and its primary um, importance as I look at interpreting events is that it brought Italy and Germany directly onto the side of Franco and led to Russia supporting the so-called legitimate government. There's a long history that I talked about last time I'm not gonna go into. And this began to serve as a place of what we would call a proxy war that Franco won 
gave Germany and Italy, which actually sent large numbers of troops, Italy did, uh, gave them a sort of prestige in their military capacity. But there was another little side part that's often not recognized in this conflict that carries important implications in a very short time later. I talked about the bombing of Guernica, which is way up here, and how that came about and what the actual consequences were in terms of what happened to the people on the ground, if you will. What happened internationally was that because the Spanish government propagandized this, blew out of proportion to what actually happened, the number of dead and wounded women and children and the rest of it, created the impression in a number of countries <clears throat> that air power could severely damage a city. Now, there'd been an Italian military, uh, I forget if he was a captain or not, named Duhay, who wrote about how the air power developed as strategic bombing of cities would basically mean the end of the need for armies to go and occupy a territory. You could just bomb the cities into oblivion and a country would surrender. So that philosophy plus this alleged demonstration of the power of an air force against a city made Britain and France in particular very wary of not just in ascendant Germany, but once German air power reached parity with France and Britain, kind of put them back saying, the last thing we want to do is let Germany bomb our cities because they'll destroy us. We just saw that in Guernica. And that's what this Italian strategist talked about. If it hadn't been propagandized to the extreme, there might have been a more realistic appraisal. But the issue that I constantly try to bring up in these discussions is that you deal with an event, but it's the interpretation of the event that really is the critical issue. Now, the other thing that many people are not aware of is something that happened in Russia. Now, Ron, you mentioned in a different conversation altogether about the famine that occurred in the Ukraine, the Holdemore, I think it's called, uh, in one of my postings that I did. And I had left that out. And that's true. There were millions of people who died in the Soviet Union, which was actually created in 1922, uh, due to mass starvation. It was awful. But more to the point of what you raised during the break is this malevolent attitude that existed in Stalin's mind and how he went about dealing with this enormous paranoia that he had because he had just finally gotten rid of Trotsky. He had gotten him exiled. He had finally established what he thought was firm control, but he became increasingly concerned, especially with some of the events in the 30s, that he would be overthrown. As a result, and partly also based on the ideology that goes back to Lenin's 21 points that I talked about in the last lecture, you had to occasionally <coughs> sort of purge purge the party. And that's how this began in 1936. And it morphed into different elements, as you'll see here. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just talking about this. Purging the elites, for example, all right? Just as an example, repressions against the kulaks, which meant that if you owned a cow or a horse, you were a kulak, and so on. There were a number of things which 
push Stalin in this regard, the failure of collectivization was one. That's one of the reasons why there was enormous suffering and famine. The five-year plan that was to industrialize the nation was off the rails in a number of ways, and there were different economic uh, policies that were enacted to try to fix it, didn't work. Then a close friend of Stalin was assassinated in 34. He saw this as, again, a threat to himself. It turns out that in whether it's completely true or not, that there were political rivals who were going to work to get him assassinated along with Kirov. But look at this down here, just in terms of the military. And this occurred primarily in 1937. Just look at that. He gutted the officer corps. Now you have no one who's been left in place who has a history of helping the Russian military, the army in particular, but involving the Navy and Air Force, who have a history of recognizing the development of the military forces and coordinating the activities all the way through. And in particular, <clears throat> when you take care of people at this high level, which sometimes we interpret as just people who draw lines on a map, we forget how sophisticated and responsible they are for the development of the Army and Air Force and Navy. We saw that with General von Siecht when I talked about him in the 1920s in Germany. Here's an issue <clears throat> that goes to the heart of part of what you were talking about, Ron, and that is how do you, how do you translate your ideology into reality and what are you willing to do to people in order to accomplish it? And this really lays out things. And where you see here, execute the executioners, at the end of the purges, that's exactly what Stalin does. <clears throat> now, total cost of the purges, I mentioned that there were roughly 37,000 army officers, but look at that number that he got rid of in just a couple of years. And what you'll see here, documentable executions Death in the gulags. Article 58, I'll just show you very quickly, has to do with how you define an enemy of the, of the worker, traitors, saboteurs, and so on. It's an interesting document to look at. But it also took place even in the Far East. And notice here, Finnish American communists, Finnish Canadians executed. Kind of an interesting spin. <clears throat> Now, how does this all comport with this? And I want to show you this uh, because I think it has a great deal of impact on how the war comes about and emphasizes Chamberlain's particular position, though he wasn't the only person there. It's a little bit of a misconstruction to say that Chamberlain was responsible for all of this. There's actually an interesting movie that I think you can get on either Amazon or Netflix that deals with this. And if I remember correctly, the name of it is actually Munich. Uh, and it shows Chamberlain in a somewhat more favorable light. But as I've been talking about and used at the beginning slide for this particular section, there were incidents and accidents, hints and allegations. So, this is the kind of thing where a responsible leader has to be very thoughtful about what's going on and can't let himself be driven exclusively by his own, I'll call it moral compass. But at the same time as human beings, we can relate to this. And I think this opening quotation from Chamberlain is particularly helpful. Anytime, any of us, and this is particularly true nowadays for us 
in the United States as we see what's been happening with our levels of global engagement, such as in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and the lessons from Vietnam, and so on, we look at this and we say, what in heaven's name are we doing? Well, our engagement to a large degree, unfortunately, and again, I apologies to those who disagree, we can talk about it later, is that we've taken our ideology and we've said, this is what you need to be doing in your home countries, as though that's going to work there. And when you begin to do that, when you begin to insinuate that we're going to change your culture and your political nature and all the rest of it, because we have the best approach that anybody could wish for, well, it doesn't always work out the way you'd like. Chamberlain kind of recognized that. He was very aware, acutely aware of the suffering of the British people in World War I. He knew what it cost. And he was doing his utmost to avoid it from happening again. He was acutely aware of the buildup of German forces. It hadn't reached their pinnacle yet, but he was very aware it was coming because once Hitler abrogated the Treaty of Versailles and specifically started rearming and made it clear to Chamberlain and Deladier and others that he had air power that was parity with both France and Britain, changed the dynamics entirely. Now, the British people similarly wanted nothing to do with this. Listen, Germany's doing what Germany's going to do. Screw it. If they want to get rid of the Jews in their own country, that's their problem. The Sudetenland, like Lugansk and Donetsk, had a very substantial German population that had been cut off from Germany when the new Czechoslovakian country was created by the Treaty of Versailles. And you say, well, that's artificial and that's imposed. Well, that's the same thing with the corridor from Poland up to Danzig, the so-called Polish corridor, so Poland would not be landlocked, but it cut East Prussia off from Germany. And we've already alluded a little bit to the Rhineland, but then Austria was considered German. And while it existed in the Austro-Hungarian Empire as a different political entity, nonetheless, Austria was German speaking with an accent, but still German. When things were developing to the point of just before September 38, Hitler had basically laid down the gauntlet. Now think about Putin doing this with Zelensky. He's saying, if you don't agree to turn the territory of the Sudetenland over to Germany, we're going to invade. And that will precipitate war. Chamberlain looks at this and says, he has a legitimate argument that these are German people and they should be part of greater Germany. Similarly, we don't want to go to war over this because in a sense, we, the British nation, the United States and so on, had made this happen. Uh, I have to take one second just to do something because I there's a particular important element I want to get here on my other computer. So hopefully this will come up. All right, now, so they're literally on the verge of going to war. Even the British, I'm sorry, even the German military is appalled by this action. Now they have 
been beaten down, if you will, over the past several years by these enormous successes that Hitler has accomplished without any fighting. But they're beginning to think this is a step too far. And this is going to be very dangerous. He literally is ready to mobilize his army and invade Czechoslovakia. And Chamberlain, who initially tried to negotiate this deal and came home without a deal, now has Goering, of all people, and Mussolini intercede to try to find a negotiated solution. And when that is finally accomplished, he returns to England thinking, boy, we just avoided war. And yes, we forced, uh, I think it's Benes to give up the Sudetenland, but you know, in terms of what this would have cost in terms of a fight, and we couldn't help Czechoslovakia anyway, uh, just this is a better deal. This is better for everybody. This shows the, what happened <laughs> very soon afterward. Uh, once the Sudetenland is stripped, Slovakia declared its independence. So the country already was ethnically frayed and then fractured. And you'll notice that Hungary and Poland took over other territories. So they saw the possibility of tearing Czechoslovakia apart. And once this happened, Hitler used it as an excuse to say, well, I got to occupy the rest of Czechoslovakia because these countries, Poland at the time, Hungary and so on, were not friendly towards Germany. And this created a deep wedge into German territory. So if we take this over, we now have a much better defensible line. And at that point, since the main defenses of Czechoslovakia had been in these blue areas in the Sudetenland due to the terrain, they now were open season. Now, as all these different crises developed, <clears throat> the key issue was that during the 30s in particular, and in the United States especially, we were dealing with the severe depression and had very little that we would see impel us to get involved in a European conflict. We had an awareness of the threats of Japan and related to China. That's a different section we'll come to later. But this in particular demonstrated that at least from the standpoint of Britain, France, and the United States, we wanted very little to do with all of these shenanigans. And we had plenty of troubles on our own home front. Now, I do want to mention this particular letter <clears throat> that uh, came from President Roosevelt after Germany took the Sudetenland. I'm going to go back to this slide. <clears throat> and it didn't come until April of 39, but that was right after Czechoslovakia uh, was occupied. And Hitler gave, frankly, a masterful speech in response to this letter. I'm going to read you a part of the letter, and then I'm going to read you a little bit of Hitler's response. But if you were a German living in Germany at that time, and your country had now been brought back together from all the fragments, had weathered the hyperinflation of the 20s and the depression in the 30s, and now you were seeing your country resurrected, how could you not, in a way, find yourself agreeing in large part with what's said? All right, so here's the letter from Roosevelt. Are you willing to give assurance that your armed forces will not attack or invade the territory or possessions of the following independent nations? Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, Belgium, 
Great Britain and Ireland, France, Portugal, Spain, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Yugoslavia, Russia, Bulgaria, Greece, Turkey, Iraq, the Arabias, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and Iran. A similar message is being addressed to the chief of the Italian government. Now, I have to say that that is almost laughable to, to think that, I mean, why didn't he just say, you won't invade anybody anywhere in the rest of the world? I mean, it just becomes almost a ridiculous statement and opens itself to considerable mockery. But it did serve as a form of a warning, an apprehension, and it was more directly intended to at least gain some confirmation that Hitler had no other ambitions. But when, when Hitler gave his speech after reading that letter to the German nation, he stipulated what his demands were for his next step. And again, I'm going to read some of this to you uh, because I think it takes us right to the brink of war in Europe. He outlines the following. Now think of this in terms of the Ukraine and Russia in part, because the Crimea is separated from Russia by the Ukraine. There's a small bridge of communication across the Kerch and Kuban Peninsula in the far east of Crimea. But Crimea is now part, it's been annexed by Russia in 2014. And there is an, a separatist group in Lukansk and Donetsk, Donetsk, which is supported by a large, actually dominant Russian population. And Putin is saying, I want an overland connection to Crimea so I can supply it. We have our main naval base there at Sevastopol, and the Russian people in Lugansk and Donetsk should be part of Russia because they're Russians. So what does Hitler say? Poland's access to the sea by way of the corridor on the one hand and a German route through the corridor on the other have no kind military importance whatsoever. Their importance is exclusively psychological and economic to attack, attach military importance to a traffic route of this kind would be to show oneself completely ignorant of military affairs. Consequently, I have caused the following proposals to be submitted to the Polish government. Danzig to return as a free state into the framework of the German Reich. Germany shall obtain a route through the corridor and a railroad line for herself with the same extraterritorial status for Germany as the corridor itself has for Poland. In return, Germany is prepared to recognize all Polish economic rights in Danzig, to ensure Poland of a free harbor in Danzig of any size desired, giving her completely free access to the sea, to accept at the same time the present boundaries between Germany and Poland and to regard them as final. To conclude a 25 year non-aggression treaty with Poland, a treaty therefore which would extend far beyond the duration of my own life and to enter into a degree of the, sorry, enter into a guarantee of the independence of the Slovak state, right? That remnant that you're seeing there by Germany, Poland, and Hungary jointly, which means in practice renunciation of any exclusive German hegemony in this territory. The, government, the Polish government has rejected my offer and declared itself prepared only to negotiate concerning the question of a substitute for the commissioner of the League of Nations, 
and to consider facilities for the transit traffic through the corridor. Now on the surface, if what you're trying to do is avoid another huge European war, and you've already turned the Sudetenland over to Germany, why would you guarantee Poland's boundaries? So that is the key to what is going to happen next. Now the next lectures are going to, the next lecture is going to deal with this. <clears throat> uh, what's going on in the Far East. But interestingly, as far as much of the world is concerned, these are two completely separate and in many ways, completely unrelated issues. Now think about the relationship between China and Russia, how there's some mutual support going on there, but intrinsically, China is an Asian nation with interests in the Pacific, and Russia's interests are still primarily focused towards Europe. This kind of issue, this pattern that we're seeing evolve up to the beginning of World War II is in a way almost scary because we've seen elements of this before. If we look at Zelensky's behavior prior to the Russian invasion and subsequent to the Russian invasion, that he has closed down all political opposition parties and melded all of the media into a state-run system. We can look at that at one level and say that makes sense given the threat that Ukraine faces. But if we go back just a short period of time, we can find our own leaders saying Ukraine was one of the most corrupt and unfortunately poorest nations in Europe. I'll leave it there. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, and I'll stay around as long as anybody is interested in talking about anything. But thank you for your attention. I know that it's a difficult time frame, and two hours can sometimes be pretty, pretty overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, that was excellent. I'll be back next time, but um, I'm worn out. <laughs> Thank you. No, not by you, but by the day and yeah. so on. So excellent, excellent. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate that. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you know anything about the role of Heydrich in goading Stalin to kill off his officer corps? I'm sorry, the role of what? Heydrich, who is a German. Um, oh, Heydrich. Um, yeah. There's been some talk that the initiative was propaganda, if you want to call it that, uh, where Germany looked to Stalin's weakness, which was his paranoia, mm -hmm. and specifically planted evidence to indicate that a coup was imminent and that he needed to do something about it. Beyond the trigger, it becomes more difficult to follow what kind of information was actually submitted to Stalin. Mm -hmm. And part of what, this is an interesting side point that you brought up and I'm gonna mention it now because we're not going to really get to it in this set of lectures, is that prior to Germany invading Russia in June of 1941, the British and uh, had been trying to warn Stalin that war was coming, that mm -hmm. Germany was planning to attack her. And they actually had some pretty good information to do that. Because of what had happened in 36 through 38, and particularly with the German propaganda instilling in Stalin great paranoia, Stalin 
rejected the information given to him saying that this was Britain trying to bring Germany and Russia into war with each other, to weaken themselves. And so it becomes an interesting dynamic. The other part of this, again, going back to the Ukraine-Russian crisis, is that the United States had been warning Zelensky prior to the invasion that Russia was planning to invade. Mm -hmm. And Zelensky rejected that information not in part because he was worried that we were trying to start a war with Ukraine attacking Russia, but because he needed to have the position that mm -hmm. Russia made the first big move. If Zelensky <laughs> tried to mobilize his forces, in anticipation of a Russian attack, the Russians might have been able to use that as an excuse to say, well, Lugansk and Donetsk have declared themselves autonomous and we are sending in peacekeeper forces. Now the Ukrainian army is going to invade those autonomous regions and destroy the Russian people there. So Zelensky had to kind of hold back a little bit politically or he could have triggered something he did not hope would happen, even though he was told it would. I muted because my dog is having a conversation with herself. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> do, do you want me to cover anything that you missed or? <laughs> no, that's what I heard you for the most. I just didn't want to disturb the flow of the talk. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, whatever. Mm. Uh, anyone else? Any comments? Anything anybody wants to address, argue, bring new information to the fore? Uh, I'm just going to uh, say that you have to be very careful with the, any comparisons with the Ukraine and the Soviet, uh, the Russians, and Putin invading it uh, with World War II. This war in Ukraine, in my opinion, and others' opinion too, uh, is a propaganda war uh, par excellence. The, the, the Russians weren't prepared for a ground war, thought that they were going to be able to take, take over Kiev, and they were going to simply march in and be all over with. When they were caught up, everything they say you can have, hardly believe. Everything Ukraine says, you can hardly believe. Okay. I don't believe that uh, 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 Zelensky didn't believe that he was going to be invaded. The Ukrainians have a fairly good intelligence service. They know what was coming. coming, right. And, and, and uh, they probably cautioned uh, this amateur president that uh, uh, he should ne not say anything about uh, fearing the Russians because they had to get their troops in place, right. set up their whole defense in a very short time against what was an enormous uh, counterforce. So uh, everything that comes out of the mouths of anybody in this in, in this thing, and they're all masters of propaganda, believe me. I, I spent a career dealing with it, but the, the, they are really, really good at it. And it's really hard to believe, unless you're sitting in the government and you have direct access to, to clear intelligence, you can't hardly believe anything that comes out of there, unless also I will add Western correspondents, that they're pretty good, but they get roped into this as well. And they go, they go to a, a, a press conference and they get fed a lot of crap. And, and it, it, isn't, it isn't crap because it's necessary. It's necessary for the Ukrainians to defend themselves. It's all part of the game. And when you're a, a weak power, you use whatever you've got. The Russians, well, KGB, but they're in charge. You know, they're, they're running the country, or he is. And I just, I just don't, I, I'm just terribly skeptical of everything that comes out of that uh, that conflict uh, until we see actual 
measurable action on the ground, and we do see it occasionally, uh, be very careful about what you say is going on. Especially you know, Henry, I, uh, I respect that. And I think you've made an excellent point. I think that I may have overdrawn some of my comparisons with what's going on. But I think in a broader scheme, maybe instead of at the 20,000 foot level, looking down, um, I'm thinking about the 50,000 foot level. <laughs> Well, it does look like that. I don't disagree with you on that. And it's it's, it's scary to think about it. To think. Yes. I don't think we're headed to World War III. That's not uh, at all what I think. I think that that is extraordinarily unlikely to happen. And I don't think it's in anyone's interest, including the Russians, uh, you know, rattling the saber as they might, that they would even think about doing that. And if they did, I think Putin would be immediately arrested, if not executed. Uh, that's just not where they want to be. What I hoped to create as the narrative was the idea that this conflict in the Ukraine, and I haven't drawn this comparison as powerfully as I sometimes think of it, Ukraine isn't our national interest. And while we have an interest in it remaining a sovereign nation, I think that at the same time, it's a little bit like France and England guaranteeing Poland's borders. Uh, you're gonna get drawn into something that is gonna go well beyond what you believe will be the outcome. And all too often, as I think history illustrates, events which we interpret in a particular fashion lead us to make decisions with an expectation of a particular outcome. Uh, <clears throat> to draw on another example, our engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I don't think anybody at the time, even with the best intelligence available and the best interpretation available, which is always subject to uh, disagreement, I don't think anybody anticipated we would be fighting there for as long as we did. I think people just looked at that and said, you got to be crazy to think we're going to do that. We just had the Russian experience in Afghanistan. I mean, we've got to be nuts to try to do that. And Afghanistan's history is such that no foreign power has ever survived trying to convert that country into anything other than what it actually is. Which is not to argue that when we first went in, we didn't have a legitimate reason to go. What we did was we extended our policy, yes. uh, our, our uh, military action to, to an unrealistic degree. And uh, to, to even have started the Iraq war was probably the same thing. All right. those are perfectly good uh, arguments on, on the other side. Yes. <clears throat> and that's the thing that is, I think, an example <clears throat> in history that I always find engaging as I you know, read different things at different times. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly struck by not the idea that you know those who ignore history are determined to repeat it. I think that's an overworked phrase, <laughs> but rather that what we're not doing are drawing the proper lessons and looking carefully at what our expected outcome is. Yeah. The ability to adjust on the fly becomes very important but governments by their very nature tend to be very sluggish oh, in boy. changing. <laughs> Tell me and about that it. in itself is good and bad. Well, it depends on the circumstances, of course. Right. Huh? Yeah, of course, <laughs> uh, exactly. Sluggish exactly. indeed, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Events on the ground always proceed and, and uh, and uh, continue on well beyond the decisions made by the parties involved. Yes, very much the case. <clears throat>
Okay. Anyone else care to comment or jump in? Dinner time. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward to seeing at least some of you show up. <laughs> <laughs> we will. Lectures. I hope that, uh, and I mean this very seriously. I, I really mean this. I hope these are valuable, not just you know, time filler, but there's something that comes out of this, which is interesting and maybe illuminating for how we can view certain actions that are happening today with admittedly what I think you, Henry, just stipulated, a caution. Yeah. Don't, don't try to move this to that and implant it in today. It's it's more a matter of understanding. And that's why I bother to go into the things on technology, because if we look at what's going on technologically and we realize where we're spending our money and the strategic direction that $700 billion plus a year is supposed to address, um, it's, it's an extraordinary commitment. And if we have people who don't know what they're doing, uh, that's an extraordinarily dangerous situation to be in. Extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, and, and it affects not just us, it affects the whole world. Yeah. It's, it becomes global. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. I'm going to stop the recording now. Thanks a lot. Very much. Okay. Wonderful. See you next yeah, Thursday. Next. Yep. Thanks, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Michael.